Thank you, Benny, and uh, thanks, Rafi, and the organizers for this beautiful meeting. Uh, I realize that uh, I realize that this has been a long day, so I will not show too many equations. Um, so what I would like is to tell you about um, uh, I took uh, Rafi's suggestions uh, very seriously about talking about the grand challenges. So uh, I will give um, uh, most of my talk, I will talk about two types of techniques that are emerging um, and uh, try to, to show how can they be useful uh, to study photosynthetic complexes and uh, other molecular systems. So the two techniques I will focus on is using quantum light in order to gain information about the molecule and the other one using um, short X-ray pulses. So I will try to cover uh, both uh, topics. So uh, uh, photosynthesis is based on complexes that uh, uh, are called antenna. They are, uh, there is a whole variety of these antenna. They are uh, sitting in the membrane, and their uh, task is to harvest the sunlight and to bring it to a reaction center where um, a charge separation occurs. Uh, I will show you some calculations that we did on this complex, LHC2, that has 14 chlorophylls and it's a trimer, uh, and also other results on, um, on FMO. So uh, the, the techniques that are uh, now uh, commonly used to study uh, the uh, the short time dynamics of these complexes to study the electron and the charge separation are multidimensional and nonlinear spectroscopy, where you put several pulses and you have uh, several delays and you do correlations of uh, what happens in these various delays and that gives you the, uh, the desired information. And in order to calculate these signals, you have to calculate a nonlinear response function. If you have four pulses, you have three delays, and all the material information about the complex and the energy and the charge is all contained here, and then you calculate the polarization that gets you the signal. And also, for displaying the signals, we usually do a double Fourier transform with respect to of these time delays, and we do two-dimensional correlation plots of these uh, different uh, signals. Now, this whole thing came from NMR uh, and gradually uh, went up the frequency ladder. Uh, the main uh, idea and importance of these techniques is that if you have uh, several chromophores, and let's say that the absorption spectrum looks like this, um, um, the, the, the chromophores can be interacting or not, you could have the same spectrum. You don't know if they are communicating or these are just three different chromophores. So if you do a two-dimensional spectrum, in a certain way, if they don't talk, you get only diagonal peaks, but if they do talk, you see cross peaks, and the cross peaks contain information about the couplings. And this is what is used in NMR to get the structure. So this field has risen from the radio waves in NMR uh, towards higher frequencies and shorter times as the technology uh, becomes available to control the phases of the pulses. And of course, you can go to shorter times. So I will be talking about, so the, the microwave, the infrared, the visible are mature. There are a few studies in the UV, and I will be talking about going to the X-ray uh, I will show you some applications for, uh, for that. So, uh, just a couple words about an extensive uh, part of this field of photosynthetic complexes that I'm sure Greg Engel will cover uh, uh, in his talk. Um, you have this complex, the FMO, that has uh, seven chlorophylls, and um, it was found experimentally well, if you look at the states of the complex, there is the ground state, there are single excitons, two excitons, and so on. So these are the only states that are relevant for our discussion, and this is the paper that showed 
by Graham Fleming's group that showed how these cross peaks build with time, and the cross peak tells you which chromophores interact. And then some oscillations were observed in these signals, and that gave a huge field of, um, 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 of quantum bio biology. People ask, is, is coherence important in biology? Is it essential for the um, photosynthetic uh, um, uh, high yield? And uh, it's a controversial issue, and it turned out that many of the effects are related to vibrations, which are, this is an example of a recent paper by Dwayne Miller. So this is currently a controversial issue. So I will not cover it, I just wanted to, um, uh, to mention it. So um, <clears throat> if we, yes. Uh, I wanted to show you uh, uh, another signal. W when you do these signals, you can look at different wave vectors. So the, the, the signals that I showed you before have a minus K1 plus K2 plus K3. This is the direction of the signal. But you can do another technique, K1 plus K2 minus K3. It's called double quantum coherence. And in this uh, <coughs> signal, you see on one axis the two exciton states, and on this axis you see the single exciton state. So you can, you can see how the single excitons interact uh, in order to give the, uh, 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 well, whether, uh, so if, if the, the single excitons do not interact, this signal will be zero because of interference. So, uh, so this signal shows you how uh, 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 how each double excitation can be decomposed into, uh, into single excitations. And these are also calculations that we did on, on FMO. All right, so that's the, the pre-introduction. Now I would like to talk about these uh, new technologies, the quantum field and the X-ray, and to try to make the point that we can learn a lot by using this a new uh, <coughs> type of um, uh, opportunities. So uh, um, for most spectroscopic applications, uh, the, the fact that light is made out of photons is immaterial. You, 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 you treat the field as a classical field, and it's good enough for virtually most spectroscopies. However, light is made out of photons, and the photons have a wave function. And the wave function can be now controlled thanks to developments in other fields, not in spectroscopy, but in quantum information and uh, uh, cryptography and so on. So there are ways to control the quantum state of light. And the quantum state of light will depend on parameters, which you can vary. And then this can give you another window to look at what's happening in the molecule. Normally, with classical light, you vary the frequency and the duration of the pulse. But with quantum light, you have many more opportunities. So one of the most <coughs> common and important source of quantum light is entangled photons. You have a nonlinear crystal. You bring a pump, and it breaks into two fields omega-1 and omega-2. These are twin photons. They are created together. So omega-1 plus omega-2 equal to omega-p. And the wave function is a superposition of these two, um, of these two uh, frequencies. <coughs> so um, the entangled photons are used in other areas, not in spectroscopy, in communication, metrology, uh, and quantum information processing. So basically, in these applications, you try to make the matter as simple as possible in order not to interfere with the light. The, the main goal is to control and manipulate the light. In spectroscopy, we have the other goal. We want to put it in interaction with a complicated molecule uh, and see what happens. So uh, in general, when you calculate a signal, it's given by a correlation function of the dipole and a correlation function of the field. So when you have an entangled photon, it gives you a certain correlation function of the field, and that gives you a new window, a different window uh, about <coughs> uh, the molecule. So if you have a, a, 
Uh, I'm talking about third order signals, so they will have four fields. And if the field is classically just a product of amplitudes, and if it's entangled photons, it breaks up in a certain way. If the light is stochastic, it breaks in a different way. So this gives you a different window on matter. So I will show you two applications of these uh, entangled photons. The first one is you do two photon absorption. And so you absorb two photons. And this signal with classical light scales quadratically with the intensity of the light because you need uh, two photons. And so it's like two particles coming uh, and you need it quadratic. However, if you do um, a two photon absorption with entangled light, it will scale linearly. And the reason is that the, the light is made of, of pair of photons. These pairs come very close together within an entanglement time which could be a few femtoseconds, and then you have many pairs. And so if you work at low intensities, the two photons come from the same pair, so it's a single particle process. You can look at the pair as one uh, uh, particle, and then the signal will go linearly with the intensity. When you go to higher intensities, you start getting absorption from two photons from different pairs, and then the light behaves classically, and it's quadratic. So this is important. It doesn't give you new spectroscopic information, but you can do um, experiments on delicate samples, biological samples that are uh, you, you want to avoid damage, and you can do the spectroscopy with much lower intensity. So this is the di direction that is being pursued. These are data from uh, uh, Ted Goodson, who has done it on several uh, organic uh, uh, complexes. So this is one feature of this. Um, okay, let me right. Um, all right, and this is again the the wave function. As I said, it contains two photons that come uh, as twins. So let me uh, show you another application where we can really le learn something new about the complex by doing the spectroscopy with the entangled light. So the, the spectrum here is, again, two-photon absorption. We looked at the reaction center uh, of photosynthetic bacteria, um, and it has a, a charge and energy transfer, so you can write it as an effective Hamiltonian with electrons, C, and holes, D. And it, 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 it represents all the energy and the charge transfer. And then when you do ordinary spectroscopy with it, like you do the type of third order signals that I showed you before, uh, you can um, get the kinetics of the different uh, states. And then you can have the two dimensional spectra that gives you the information about uh, the energy transfer. So now I would like to apply this entangled pair to this complex. And so um, th this is the, um, if I look at the two photons, um, uh, omega 1 and omega 2, each one of them has a broad spectral distribution. But the sum is narrow. The sum is controlled by the initial. So, Basically, you have an entanglement time that is very short related to the separation between the two photons, and then you have this. So what you have here, you can have short spectroscopy because you can exploit the fact that these are broadband and they, they are short, but in the same time, omega 1 plus omega 2 is narrow. So you are not subjected to the Fourier limit that, you, that controls the frequency and, uh, and the time. So you can look at short times and in the same time have a high resolution of omega 1 plus omega 2. So if I do a two photon absorption, I'm looking at omega 1 plus omega 2. So what I will, I will show you that you can use this to get a very nice control and better resolution of the um, of the of the two uh, photon absorption of the complex, so um, right. So this is uh, the complex, 
uh, the, the reaction center, and here is the uh, absorption spectrum, and these are the two pulses, omega-1 and omega-2. They cover the whole uh, regime, and then we do some model of relaxation, uh, and this is what happens. Uh, in the model, we have, uh, uh, I think, uh, 20 single exciton states and about 40 double exciton states. So what happens when you do classical light? You excite, let's say, resonant with E6, the, the, the 6 exciton level. It relaxes in 100 femtosecond to E5, and then you end up in F11, in the 11th state of the double exciton manifold. However, if you come with the entangled pair, they come within few femtosecond, so you can go up, you can beat this relaxation, and then you will end up in F23. In the same time, you can resolve F with high resolution in frequency, because omega 1 plus omega 2 is narrow. So you are, um, you are basically having an unusual time and frequency resolution that is not possible to do with classical light. Um, so what I'm showing here is, I'm varying the entanglement time. So when the entanglement time is short, it means that these are really, uh, uh, the, the entanglement is, is important. When the entanglement time becomes long, they become like classical fields. And so this is the population of state 11 and the population of state 12. And what you see from these figures is that when, when the entanglement time is short, you have a high yield of F23, but when it becomes uh, longer, then you get the, uh, uh, the, the F11, which is the usual one that you get with a classical light. So it gives you a degree of control uh, uh, and a, a way to, uh, to have both time and frequency resolutions uh, in the same uh, time. So uh, now, um, the skeptics will say, Is it re do I need really quantum light for that? Can't I do it with classical light? So let's say that we do the following. That's what a typical referee of Fisher letter will ask you. So uh, you can use what is called chirped pulses. These are pulses whose frequency changes with time. And you can take a pair of chirped pulses, one the chirp going up and the other the chirp going down, when you put them together, the sum of the frequency remains uh, uh, well defined, but the pulses are, uh, are short. So you can mimic this behavior by using these chirped pulses. And the question is, what does it give you uh, for the signal? So these are the populations of the different F states, the, the two exciton states. And this is what I get with entangled photons, so I can really well resolve them as a function of the pump frequency. If I use just stochastic light, I lose all the structure because I lose the frequency resolution. And if I do chirp pulses, it's somewhere in between. So the quantum light does a better job. It, it has a better signal to know. The reason is that there are several contributions to the signal, and in the entangled photon, you get only the desired ones, and here you have a background of ones that don't exploit the entanglement. So, um, so these two examples that I showed you is uh, a, a, a one type of quantum light that can uh, be used to control, for example, in this case, the exciton transport, because you can beat it uh, at the same time having the higher frequency resolution. Now, there is another type of quantum light. Uh, that, well, there are many other types of quantum light, but one that I would like to talk about is obtained by putting a molecule in a cavity. This is a very simple device. A cavity is like two mirrors where you have a, a, a photon mode that, uh, that is strong within the cavity. And uh, if you put a molecule in the cavity, the molecule interacts uh, strongly with that photon. The, the strength of the coupling goes like the 
1 over the square root of the volume, and then the molecule and the photon becomes a, a, a one entity, and you have to treat new stairs that are called polaritons. These are combined stairs of the metal plus radiation. So you use the fact that the field is quantum in order to modify the states of the molecule just by putting them in a cavity. And what happens is, if you take a ground state and an excited state, a ground state with a photon will interact strongly with the excited state without a photon and you will get a splitting. And so you will get the absorption spectrum will show you two lines. Now, um, you can use it to alter uh, like curve crossing or avoided crossing. This is a calculation that we did on uh, sodium fluoride. Uh, you, have, uh, you have here a, a, an avoided crossing, and these are the potentials of the bare molecule, but when you put it in the cavity, you get completely different potentials. And so the photochemistry will change by simply putting it in a cavity. Ahmed Zawel did this beautiful experiment on sodium iodide where he did it without cavity and he measured the, uh, how the uh, population goes back and forth between the two states. And if you do it in a cavity, you can suppress the, the, uh, the curve crossing and the, well, this is the population, how it changes without the cavity, and in a cavity, you can really suppress it and make the, uh, the, make the, the transfer uh, inefficient. So this is another uh, quantum effect of the light. And uh, now let me show you uh, how uh, this can be used in uh, photosynthesis uh, or photosynthetic complexes. You can take an antenna and you can put it inside the cavity and then the antenna has many states and the spectrum is congested but in the cavity because of the strong coupling to the photons you get few states that are dominant and they become well separated and so you can study it. So what we did, we calculated the following, we took the complex LHC2 and we studied the uh, Again, we did a two-photon excitation, and then we detect spontaneously emitted photons, and they come in pairs, because you have the doubly excited to the single and the single to the ground, and we do a coincident uh, spectroscopy of these two photons. Uh, so, this is, uh, um, uh, so this is quantum field, because we are doing it in a cavity, and we are also doing a coincidence coupling uh, of the two photons. So this is the, uh, the setup, and uh, what happens is that if you increase the strength of the coupling to the cavity, which you can vary by the cavity geometry, the spectrum that looks like that becomes two sharp lines corresponding to these polaritons. Now these polaritons are mixed state of the molecule plus the photon, and they will have different chemistry and different uh, behavior, as I showed you before. So now you can see how the population of the excited state varies when I increase the strength of the coupling because the, the states are completely different and you can control the transport. And then if you look at the a correlation spectrum, this is omega 1, omega 2. This is a coincidence of these two photons you can increase the, the coupling and get very nice, well-resolved spectra. So by simply putting a molecule in a cavity and doing a coincidence detection, you can get uh, a new information. Um, now, uh, let me turn to the second topic uh, in, the, in the remaining time. Um, I would like to show you that by using X-ray pulses, which is again, it's a new technology that is made available by free electron lasers or by a high harmonic. We heard the talk of Ferenc Krauss, who is one of the pioneers uh, of these uh, pulses. Uh, so you can use X-ray pulses in order to study molecules in a, in a very <coughs> different way that is very powerful. 
And what I'm talking about is doing a Raman spectrum with the X-ray pulse. When you have an ordinary Raman spectrum, you go up and down and you excite a vibration. If you come with an X-ray pulse, the X-ray can be resonant with some core excitations. And uh, uh, what happens, you go up and down, and then you create an excitation of the valence uh, exi uh, electronic excitations. So the X-ray pulse can do to the electrons what an optical pulse does to the vibrations. It can excite them impulsively. And so you can get a superposition of valence states, and this superposition will have dynamics, and the superposition can be quite broad. If you have a 100 attosecond pulse, you have a 10 EV bandwidth, so you can create such a superposition, and then you can do a, a Raman spectrum of the molecule. So in terms of the physics, uh, in ordinary Raman, you look at the normal modes, and you look how the polarizability varies with the normal modes. That what gives you the Raman activity. In the X-ray, these are electron hole pairs. The, the pulse interacts with electron hole pairs, and this looks like the vibrations that you see in the ordinary uh, Raman. Okay, so uh, let me show you an example. So um, let me just step back. The main reason for developing these free electron lasers is to do time result diffraction. Diffraction, you go off resonant and you make a snapshot of the charge density. So this has been a goal that is being, uh, has been realized. I am talking about using it to do resonant spectroscopy, which is not just looking at the, ch at the charge density, but looking at, uh, uh, at excitations in the molecule. So basically, if I do this Raman process, uh, uh, so this is cysteine, it has a sulfur, nitrogen, and oxygen. If you are resonant with one of them and you do this Raman process, you will create a valence excitation in the vicinity of that selected atom. And then you can let it evolve, you can come up with another Raman pulse and detect it. So you can watch the electronic motion uh, nicely uh, in, uh, in real time. So this is an, um, a signal that we calculated with two short pulses uh, with one delay, and we can excite the nitrogen or the oxygen of any combination. This is a one-dimensional signal. It only has two pulses. But as theoreticians, we can add as many pulses as we want, and the technology is coming. You know, There are experiments now with two pulses, pump probe, and this is coming. So let me show you the electron and the whole charge density that is um, uh, uh, created by such a pulse. If you are resonant with the sulfur, you see that the hole is localized on the sulfur. So you can really create by design, you can uh, create uh, excitations in certain parts of the molecule, and then you can watch how they evolve. And now you can do multi-dimensional signals by repeating it as many times uh, as you need, and then you can watch the evolution. So let me show you uh, one example. Uh, uh, this is a porphyrin dimer. We have a zinc and a nickel, and then what we do, we can excite resonant with one of them, we create energy in this ring, and then we can watch how the energy flows between the rings. Now, you can do such experiment also with optical pulses, but the excitation in optics is not always localized, and you have no control over it. You are at the mercy uh, of the, uh, of the uh, exciton states of the molecule. With the X-ray, when you excite resonant with an atom, you are uh, uh, exciting at that vicinity. So this is the uh, X-ray uh, absorption spectra of the zinc and the nickel, and we look at the uh, K edge and the L edge. This is 8 kilo electron volts. This is uh, 800 volts. So um, this is what you see. Uh, when you do two pulses and you vary the delay, um, and you have different combinations of exciting different atoms and different cores, you get in one snapshot, you get the whole picture of all the states with the, the 10 EB uh, uh, bandwidth uh, of this pulse. 
Uh, this is an interesting thing. If you excite the zinc and you probe the nickel or the other way, uh, don't look. If you do it the other way, it's not totally symmetric, uh, and so the signals are different, and this is the difference uh, between the signals, and this shows you how the energy flows, the electron and the hole, vary as you go in time. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Uh, all right, so I think um, I will just uh, briefly mention that uh, you can use these X-ray pulses in order to, to detect uh, conical intersections. The idea is that during the conical intersection you create an electronic coherence and you can do a Raman signal that only looks at the coherence, which means if there is no coherence, there is no signal. Now, all other signatures of conical intersections, you have uh, to infer that there is a conical intersection by doing analysis and so on. This signal will only exist if there is a coherence, so it will only exist if there is a conical uh, intersection. So um, we uh, calculated the, si the signal is done by um, exciting the molecule with the broadband and the narrowband pulse, and then looking at uh, the Raman uh, signal. And uh, we gave it a very nice name, true cars, transient distribution, and so on. But it turns out that there is a car insurance company called True Car. <laughs> so if you do a Google search, this will beat us. But in any case, when you look at the signal, um, uh, let me show you what you get. Uh, you get as a function of time, you can get the splitting between the two states that are crossing as a function of time. The red and the blue are gain and loss, and they reflect the phase of the superposition that you create. So this, the X-ray allows us to probe the conical intersection to get the electronic state and to get even the phase of, uh, uh, of the wave function. If you don't resolve it in frequency, you integrate, you still can see a gain and loss, but with the frequency resolution, you can get it more. So I think uh, uh, I will end now. Thank you. Thank you. Spectroscopic signatures, questions. Yes, your questions. This is beautiful, but FMO contains eight clones, not seven. Right, the eighth one, this was done before the eighth was detected, and the eighth. I discovered it more than 15 years ago. Okay, but it was. In terms of the spectroscopy. It's only an example that you can eliminate one and two. Right. More questions. Your question, please. Uh, so, how do you control uh, how do you control the uh, entanglement time in, in the uh, uh, entangled time the uh, experimentally? Is by spectral waves, or how do you? No, no, by the by the uh, by the crystal, by the propagation in the crystal. Uh, the the. the or oh, the time delay the, between the, the, the size of the crystal. But also, there is another thing. There is another technology to do pulse shaping on top of the crystal that is generated. Thomas Fuhrer in Bern has been doing it. So you can also control it by pulse shaping afterwards. But you do it at the level of the generation, by the size of the crystal and the direction of the propagation. Thank you. you have a question? Concerning um, these potential energy surfaces for molecules in the cavity, are those the same as Floquet surfaces? Uh, sorry? Are those the same as Floquet surfaces? Yes, except that usually you do Floquet, uh, you do Floquet by putting a strong field, and here you do it with the vacuum mm -hmm. field. Uh, that, that there is no, there are no photons in the cavity. But uh, the excited state can emit a photon, and uh, you get a strong coupling. Yeah, it is, mm -hmm. it is a fluke. Mm -hmm. Yes. What's the next question? 
Shaul, uh, how to handle dephasing? Are there any tricks to uh, get dephasing to be long, longer, or with light perhaps, or other ways? Have you thought about this problem of dephasing? Uh, well, this is uh, one of the most important problems for quantum computing and for many other applications. No, we haven't done applications in order to, uh, to, to reduce dephasing here. Yeah, we, we haven't done it, but it's an important issue because you want to get long coherence times uh, for many reasons, right? But uh, that could be a direction of future. This is a grand challenge, yeah. I take the liberty to ask one naive question. I mean, you've shown us here really new spectroscopic signatures, and yet none of these signatures use the k-vector property of the light. Doesn't the k-vector offer possibilities of telling you something about the system? Yeah, I showed you, I showed you two photon absorption, and the two photon absorption is the simplest nonlinear technique. But you can do wave mixing, which I showed you before, with the entangled light. Okay. We haven't done it, but of course you can do the wave mixing with the entangled light, and then you can make use of the wave vector, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. More questions? If not, thank, let's thank you again.